Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us this evening. I am Srili Kapale, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through this program is to bring in guests that can address challenges facing our communities, provide solutions, and inspire change. While this country is grappling with race, identity, and culture wars, Asian Americans have competed and succeeded in America by following the rules of meritocracy, but now they find themselves competing in an elite sphere where those rules don't work. Asian Americans are forced to learn to adapt to and even change a culture where identity politics threatens fundamental American ideals. To discuss all these, I have invited Kenny Zhu, an author, podcaster, and Robert Novak Journalism Fellow this evening. Kenny scored an instant touchdown with his first book, An Inconvenient Minority. He's joining us with his insight and wisdom, courage and clarity, humor and humanity, not to mention his passion for truth and leadership to inform and inspire. Kenny Zhu is the president of the Race Blind Advocacy Group, Color Us United, and the host of the podcast, Inconvenient Minority. It is a podcast that deeply investigates race, identity, and culture. Kenny actually grew up in Richmond, Virginia, so he's a Virginian, and he later moved to Princeton, New Jersey with his family in his high school years. He attended Davidson College and graduated magna cum laude with a major in mathematics and a minor in philosophy. While I'm speaking to Kenny, please feel free to put your questions in the Facebook chat, and I'll get to as many questions as I can. Kenny, welcome to our conversations that count. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sir Leka. This is an amazing opportunity. Thank you. Kenny, I have read your book, An Inconvenient Minority. For those of our viewers that are hearing about this book for the first time, An Inconvenient Minority is about the Ivy League discrimination lawsuits and comments on Asian Americans' inconvenient place in the racial victimhood. This book was actually sold out the first printing in one month and was highly ranked in the category of Asian American history, discrimination and racism and teacher training and studies. It continues to be one of the most definitive and widely consumed books used by thinkers on race and meritocracy today. You all should consider buying it. So Kenny, what motivated you to author this book? Great question. So I grew up uh, in a you know, in an entrepreneurial family, you know, my dad, my mom, they came here with basically no money. Um, but as I was growing up, I witnessed both my parents start small businesses. Um, and I, I really bought into the idea of hard work, right? I, I saw the fruits of hard work, you know? Um, now my dad's businesses never really took off, but I saw how, how much love and he, he put that in there. And it really taught me to understand that your, the fruits of your effort should be in a just society, connected with your skills, your talents, your ability to produce something that other people want, right? Absolutely. And Asian Americans in our country today have become very good producers of many different kinds of skills, right? They've become great computer engineers. Um, they've become great teachers, great academics. Um, they've become great scientists. Um, they've, they've come and, and, and been able to build the American dream, not only for themselves, but for other people by producing, right? But here, as Asian Americans, have continued to progress throughout society. They are now facing a new roadblock. And I witnessed this when I was applying to colleges, you know, in high school. Uh, I, I lived in Princeton, New Jersey um, for high school. I didn't go to Princeton, but I, went, I lived in Princeton, New Jersey, where I saw people get their college. Everybody was obsessed with college. Everybody was obsessed with elite colleges. And the people who got in to the most elite colleges were not the people who were the smartest kids in the classroom, the kids that, that we knew could perform, the kids that we knew had knowledge that they wanted to contribute. 
a lot of times these kids are people who got in because of stories that they told about either themselves, their, their, their victimhood, their race, their gender, their sexuality, um, or they got in because they were children of professors, they were children of legacy people, or their daddy just gave a lot of money to the college. Wow. And what I saw really challenged my belief. It really shook my belief that hard work is leading to good fruits in this country, in this society. And I don't want our country to become like the college admission system at Princeton and Harvard and everything like that. I want our college country to be better than that. So I decided to write my book, An Inconvenient Minority, to speak to these truths. So Kenny, as you're saying, it's kind of disheartening. I have two kids. One is just out of uh, Fairfax County. One is still in Fairfax County schools. I've seen my son struggle with these college applications, trying to come up with a great story. Uh, and it shouldn't be, and the story shouldn't be a victimhood story to say how dreadful your life was in order to make it to elite schools. It should be about your credentials. So as a mom, as a parent that um, where my son went through, I kind of feel it. In fact, I've, I've kind of been in circles where I've seen parents kind of talking about how they have to put up a nice website so their children's accomplishments uh, are uh, fabricated uh, just so the elite colleges would uh, notice that. And I think that victimhood fabrication should go away. And that's precisely, I'm such an advocate of objective tests. Yes, it should be a somewhat of a holistic approach, but you should have some base objectivity tests in order to get into these schools. Kenny, that, uh, thank you for explaining about your experience. I know you have done these kind of written commentary for the Wall Street Journal, City Journal. I looked at your bio and I, 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 if nobody knows how old you are, I would think you're 70, right? You've talked about this in Newsweek, the New York Post, National Review, Federalist, in fact, the Washington Examiner and the Daily Signal. So I guess my question is, how is your journalism received by not only within Asian American communities, which I'm sure resonates very well, but I'm curious to know, what about communities of all races? Do you think uh, all of those listeners and viewers share your passion for making the United States a more fair and meritocratic society? Or is it just Asian Americans? I think they do. I think they do. And the reason why is, you know, it is true. My journalism has been widely shared in many, many different outlets. Um, but the unifying factor and the reason why it seems that it's been taking off is because inherently, I think Pete, there is this feeling in people's hearts right now in this country that we should, that we are straying away from a society in which hard work, skills, talent, the things that matter, the things that are productive is being rewarded. I think that's a feeling that's shared by Asians, by Latinos, by Blacks, by Whites, um, by everybody. Um, ultimately, most people in this country, I'm not going to say all, because some people are corrupt enough that they are willing to exploit their own race and gender for their own benefit. But I think most people just want to be treated on the basis of the content of their character, not the color of their skin. There's a reason why Martin Luther King's quote there, which by the way, does not even reflect the entirety of Martin Luther King's beliefs. And anybody, any King scholar knows that. But there's a reason why that quote in particular has resonated through the decades and is something that is being taught universally, not just by schools, but by parents to their kids over and over again. Because if that is a revelation of what is really in people's hearts in this country right now. We want to live in a country where hard work is rewarded, where you're not treated on anything but what you can offer to other people. That does not mean we want equality of outcomes, ridiculously. And it does not mean that we want everybody to be rewarded the same way, because we know that some people prioritize certain things in different industries, different parts, and some people don't prioritize anything. Some people really are listless, lazy people, and they shouldn't be rewarded. Um, that's, there, there are many truths that I think that this book, An Inconvenient Minority, is exposing. Um, but one of them is, if you actually look at the data, Asian Americans study twice as many hours. 
on average, studied twice as many hours on average. You cannot say that is because of their race. It's not because Asians are inherently predisposed to study twice as many hours as the average kid, but it is because of culture. It's because from, from a young age, many Asian Americans born to many immigrant parents who don't have money, they see education as a way out, as a way up the ladder, and they teach it to their kids and their kids learn and their kids are ingrained into that. And they study really hard and they work really hard. And there is, there is, they should be rewarded for that, you know? Just, and I think people of all races see and empathize with that story. And it, uh, it's very encouraging to know that this is not just Asian American problem. This is countries. It doesn't matter what race. Nobody wants to be treated that way. Uh, and I think, um, Kenny, the reason why, why I am so passionate about it is absolutely it's affecting the college applications. It's affecting the high school and all of that good stuff. But uh, as a working mom, I see that it's affecting in corporate world. The same culture is coming to corporate walls, not for profit sectors and organizations. The reason it is scary is that, uh, so uh, we have to depend on many other factors to kind of move up the ladder versus your hard work and um, your merit and the things that you do, you taking in extra projects and stuff. None of that is playing out anymore. I'm a working woman, I can say that for sure that uh, this is spreading and that's precisely why I appreciate the courage from you to speak out because at a certain point we got to curb this culture. So uh, Kenny, you also have spoken of colorblindness and critical race theory in front of groups as diverse as the nationally renowned Pacific Legal Foundation for the Boston Rally for Education Rights to all the Black Connecticut Parents Union. You were also on Fox News. I, I think right before this, I was saying I've kind of watched you on YouTube shows, Newsweek, the Epoch Times, uh, and you were featured about this in the New, New, New York Times Magazine and in fact NPR. How is your commentary received by the audience at large? I know I asked you about uh, communities at large. Do you feel that uh, when you are talking about this, do you feel challenged explaining to folks that don't believe in your way of thinking? I believe in it because we come from the same backgrounds, but do you feel like you're challenged um, uh, unnecessarily by people that don't believe in your ideology? How, how, and if so, how do you kind of navigate that lane? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I don't, I don't ever believe that I'm challenged unnecessarily. I believe that people have the right to challenge me, um, and oftentimes they do. However, um, <laughs> it doesn't mean that their, their arguments are always the greatest, and I, I tend to point it out. Um, I get some legitimate challenges, I do, um, and then I get some not so legitimate challenges. Here's a legitimate challenge that I'm gonna pose to your audience that I got from, um, from, from, from many progressives. And they say, well, Kenny, you know, um, don't you believe that some groups have been historically oppressed in this country and that therefore they should be given favors that are not in accordance with them based on their merit because of their uh, more difficult starting place? Um, and I first remind them, okay, um, there, there are certain disadvantages that some people have, that some groups have faced because of the color of their skin in this country. And there still is residual effects of that, not surprising at all. However, many immigrant Asians as well have come to this country facing severe disadvantages. Um, more, most importantly, the lack of social connections, the lack of any generational wealth, the lack of uh, cultural knowledge and understanding that even black, many black Americans have. Asian Americans sometimes don't even speak the language. Um, they face a lot of barriers here to come to this country, barriers to come to this country as well. And yet Vietnamese immigrants come to this country, 80% of them don't even know English. Don't even know English. And within one generation, their kids graduate from college at a higher rate than even white Americans. You cannot look at that statistic and tell me something culturally isn't going on. 
these Vietnamese immigrant parent families are, are, really, are really honing in on something, focusing on it, teaching discipline to their kids. Their kids grow up and they become very fine producers in our society. And that's something that everybody should cherish. Everybody should celebrate. Kids who grow up in black families who come from the army, who come from the military, exhibit much higher incomes, much higher, not just incomes, but productive capabilities um, because of that structure that the military provides. So you tell me culture doesn't matter. No, culture matters very much across all races, all races. Um, now, sometimes I get these illegitimate, um, sometimes I get you know, certain illegitimate challenges to an inconvenient minority as well. I remember I went on uh, Rising, um, which is a show from The Hill, um, and the host basically said, well, Kenny, don't you think that Asians and Blacks have very different narratives in this country? And I say, so what do you, what do you mean? What is, how does that bear any implication um, upon the scope of my book? And his implication was that Asians were less oppressed than Blacks. Um, as a, as a, um, as a category, categorically. And that is a, that is a strain of thought that is very virulent among progressives. They're basically creating an intersectional hierarchy where Black Americans are the most oppressed, and then Latinos, and then Asians are basically like white adjacent. That's what they would call them. They're like, they're right up there with whites in terms of privilege. And that's extremely dangerous to think. It's a very dangerous line of thought you're going down because by the mere fact that Asians have higher incomes or as high incomes as whites is not because of privilege, but is because of a culture of hard work and achievement that has been embedded in that, uh, that is embedded in that. And the instant you turn that into a statement on privilege is the instant that you are attacking the foundations of meritocracy in America today. Absolutely. Kenny, culture is the foundation of family, the country, and the globe. I think uh, you bring up so many good points. Let me dissect it just a bit so our audience and I can understand better. When you're talking about these progressives, the questions that you're getting, is that from first generation progressives or second generation? I have a very good reason to ask. As I just said, I run this minority and immigrant coalitions as part of community engagement. Uh, and um, you know, a gentleman that uh, was part of the group made a very good point saying that my parents who came here wanted to have a child in the United States because they realized that this is the land of opportunity and waited seven years to get to United States. And that is the privilege they gave me. However, people living in my neighborhood that belong to my community who are second generation like him did not think it was a privilege. So I, I wonder if the progressive uh, mentality is uh, incrementally is getting worse based on generations and what's your take on that? Yeah, three words, critical race theory. Okay, okay. That's so a, this is where we have to get into this debate. It's where we have to get into this debate. Why are second generation Asians and people and really immigrants of all races, why are second generation Latinos, um, why are second generation immigrants, basically children born in America, raised in the American education system, why do they develop views so disparate from their parents when the old proverb says the apple doesn't typically fall for, far from the tree? Why is it different with these second gen immigrant kids? And the reason, education, seriously. You can't, there's no, there's no, there's no other explanation because that, that's the system. The, ed, the, the education system is what happened. And the education system right now is teaching a very divisive racial framework, very divisive racial narrative to the point where it says whites are at the top, blacks are at the bottom. Again, Asians are like white adjacent, Latinos are down there with blacks, depending on who you talk to. The point is to create a divisive racial hierarchy. And kids are being taught this day after day, it's in their bloodstream. Instead of moving towards a race blind society where we can stop caring about race, we can stop treating each other on the basis of race. We're now 
opening new wounds, wounds that don't need to be opened, back into the discourse. And um, CRT, critical race theory. I've even had stories where there's an Asian, half Asian kid born to a Chinese mother and a white father, comes back from school one day, says, my father is racist. And, and I, so, you know, so he's, he's a white man. He doesn't understand his privilege, blah, blah, blah. This is what it, and, and literally the school is splitting this kid from his father yeah. by teaching him that they are fundamentally different based on what they look like. That's that wrong. Super sad. And thank you that for actually talking about an example because I think it's a very important our community needs to listen that these are real stories. Uh, what else could go wrong um, with, uh, if not education? That's where the indoctrination is happening. So Kenny, while we are speaking about the education, let me ask you a question. I know you are the youngest board member of the Asian American Coalition for Education and Students for Fair Admissions. For our viewers that might not be familiar with this organization, it is an organization that sponsored the Ivy League lawsuits and an identity politics journalist for nearly two years. So I want you to elaborate on your role in that organization. I also am more curious to know what, is, what are the current strategies or initiatives and if they have any long-term goals. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm on, I'm on the board of Asian American Coalition of Education, which helped sponsor um, the lawsuit against Harvard. Um, same thing, I'm on the board of Students for Fair Admissions, which is the organization actually suing Harvard. They're the ones gathering all of this talent um, within their membership uh, to show uh, that Harvard's policies are discriminating for the sake of what Harvard calls diversity, diversity and inclusion. And that's the new term, I'm sure you guys have heard of it. And anybody who's worked remotely in a corporate company um, has probably heard of it. Um, look, it stems from, diversity and inclusion stems from the college admissions rationale for racial discrimination. That's what you should know. Um, Harvard's argument, by the way, the argument that was made at the very at the very beginning of this whole racial preferences, like should colleges admit on the basis of race, should colleges admit people with lower qualifications, but who happen to be black over a person with higher qualifications, but who happen to be white or Asian now? Um, that's the fundamental question that we're asking. That's the fundamental question. And Harvard's argument is, we do need to admit that lower qualified person who happens to be um, black because um, over the higher qualified white or Asian person for the sake of diversity, what they mean is a diverse student body. They want diverse perspectives. Here's the problem with that argument. Problem with that argument is that people within races are far more diverse than just what you can generalize based on race or based on a person's race. For example, 71% of black kids who, who are in Harvard right now are from wealthy backgrounds, upper middle class or higher backgrounds. Okay, 71%, I mean, 70, seven out of 10 black students at Harvard come from relatively privileged backgrounds, the similar sort of backgrounds and even the white kids at Harvard and the Asian kids at Harvard come from, okay? Another thing is that when you start doing too much of this, and Harvard has been doing this in a, in a very systematic way over time, so they have been doing this a lot over time, when you start doing more and more of this, you start getting what's called a mismatch effect. That means that these kids who are coming in at significantly lower qualifications, well, obviously, you know, and it doesn't mean by, I'm not making a statement, by the way, that they can't learn or that the college can't build them up, but it certainly is harder. It's certainly more challenging. These kids tend to actually graduate at the bottom 25% of their law school. Did you know if you graduate at the bottom 25% of your law school class, you're less likely to get a job, to get a good paying lawyer job than if you went to a lower tier school, law school, but graduated in the top 25%. So we're actually doing a disfavor for these kids in many cases. Um, and so, there's, there's a lot of issues, angles that I could talk about here, but 
fundamentally, that is Students with Fair Admissions is the organization suing Harvard for discrimination in the name of diversity. And I am on the board. Candy, let me, uh, I don't want to digress, but I definitely want to ask uh, this question. So once they get out of the uh, these elite colleges and the bottom 25%, because that's what their ability was, which is really nothing wrong, right? But only if you are in the right college, you probably could be the top 25%. But Correct. since organizations are also getting to be the same standards, right? They want this diversity, they want this inclusion. Do you think they'll continue to progress in organization and get into these boardrooms, ultimately decreasing the entire quality of American system? Is that a potential issue just because the culture is spread everywhere right now? I think they will. And by the way, this stems from education as well. Um, the, you know, because of this, and because the college does not want to acknowledge this because they believe so wholeheartedly in this diversity ideal and they don't believe in the capacity problem, which is the idea that there are relatively, well, we don't need to go into that, but because they don't believe in that idea, uh, because they believe so heavily in this diversity idea, they have actually started doing things like grade inflation um, to make the curve in grading seem less, um, seem softer. They've done things like they've actually started revising math curricula across the entire United States to teach a lower rigor math so that everybody can pass it. Um, now they're doing things like they're getting rid of the SAT in admissions. Um, now, thank God, MIT just restored the SAT in admissions because there is some sanity within that college. But colleges like UC Berkeley, Harvard, my alma mater, Davidson College, they're done away with it permanently. They're not, they're not accepting standardized tests anymore. And you're like, well, we shouldn't base their scores on a test, but colleges have never based their admissions solely on a test. But the fact that they're getting rid of it means that they don't want the accountability. They don't want to see the, the average discrepancy um, because they're afraid of what that information might tell them. Um, uh, in terms of that progressing into the corporate world, Yes, now you're seeing Goldman Sachs saying, well, we need 15% of our um, board members. We need 15% of all of the board members of fir firms that we contract with to have black um, representation uh, or women representation. Um, we, we have um, many other firms doing these DEI policies where they are hiring and promoting on the basis of race now, where American Express right now, which by the way, if you could, if you support our efforts, go to unamericanexpress.com. Uh, but American Express right now is giving bonuses out to hiring managers to hire people in a certain racial equity metric. Um, that means that they're incentivized when they're making their hiring decisions to err on the side of firing the white person and hiring the black person. Wow. Um, because they're actually being given bonuses for wow. equity. So this is coming into the corporate boardroom. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna affect our culture of excellence for our nation's history. Kenny, that is news to me. I had not heard that. That's like taking things to extreme, but I'm not surprised at all. I don't doubt what you're saying. Um, again, I'm not surprised. I mean, again, as I said in the beginning of the show, this goes live on Facebook. We have some very good uh, uh, things from our viewers that talks about good to have you here about your book. But there is a point that I want to make uh, one of our viewer, Medina, is talking about. She does say that there's some misconceptions that hard work will get you anywhere you want. It's simply false. Stop imagining things would always go your way when your child studies hard. That's an old fashioned way. In reality, your success depends mostly on how you survive with the skills and talents. Not everything is about the grade, but I do recognize that there are some truly talented Asian American students. Uh, let them thrive. What I'm saying is that not all hardworking students would get to everywhere again it goes on this country gives the most opportunities to the most ambitious individuals which i think she has a point i mean yes the the country is a land of opportunity so grades alone does not matter that's why there is some merit to holistic approach but you can go to the extreme and base all your decisions based on everything else but uh, the grade what do you say to that 
yeah, so we need to define what's truly meritorious in our country, which I think is a great discussion for us to have. I think it's a far better discussion for America to have than the current discussions that we're having, that's for sure. But I think we should define what is truly meritorious, what truly impacts others, brings um, purpose to other people and gives life for this country. And I think one of those things is ambition. I think you need people who are truly courageous, who are speaking out, who are ambitious, um, who stand up for their thing, who stand up for what they believe in. There's absolutely no doubt that that's a huge part of, of, of what is truly meritorious. Um, but there's also no question that acad raw academic ability, you cannot replace it, especially in an academic setting like a Harvard or a Princeton or a law school. Um, people who are not academically uh, as capable will tend to struggle in academically rigorous courses. Who knew? Um, that happens, um, and we see the data play out. Um, this is why, unfortunately, Black Americans tend to graduate at the bottom 25% of their top law school classes. This is not because Black Americans are inherently less smart or anything like that. I mean, that's, that's not part of the discussion at all. This is because policies right now are bringing in Amer those people of those certain color on the basis of their color when they could have thrived in a university or in a law school that would have served them better. So yes, um, Intelligence is a, is a major, probably one of the most fundamental parts of, of your ability to academically achieve. Um, and uh, it, that needs to be demonstrated, um, absolutely. But, you know, when you're, uh, look, my dad was a business owner, right? To be a business owner, a small business owner, especially with not much capital, which my dad did not have, he did not have much capital. Um, it requires a certain level of fortitude. It requires a certain level of courage. And he taught that in me. And we should, in the, in the game of business, I think courage is a meritorious factor. Ambition is a meritorious factor. Um, and so people should be looking at that and should be figuring out ways in which they can tell that. Kenny, I think I appreciate this meritocracy definition, right? Because the last thing we want to give impression to our audience or anybody for that matter, it, it's all about grades. It's about multiple things. I think you said having the courage to invest in something and work for it, have the passion to accomplish this or learn a new skill. All those belong to meritocracy range. So um, Kenny, I heard, I, uh, I heard several of your podcasts and I think you made a very good point in one of the podcasts. Jewish Americans went through exactly what Asian Americans have gone through, but I think they kind of uh, navigated it because they have a better political voice. Uh, they are very um, collaborative. They have they understand that policy and politics should be part of your blood. I think finally, Asian Americans have begun finding their political voice in this cu cultural discourse. And I'm thinking when I'm saying that, I'm thinking about the Proposition 16 campaign that Yingma, she was here on our podcast last year. And now uh, in our own backyard with the uh, TJ Coalition, Thomas Jefferson case that you are familiar with, that's happening in Supreme Court right now. Do you consider that uh, these things are a progress where Asian Americans are finally waking up and saying that they need to be active in the policy world and political world in order to thrive in this American society? What do you think? First, I also want to get your take on TJ coalition case that's now in Supreme Court, but I also want to understand a little bit of uh, your take on uh, our, our role in political and policy world. Yeah, absolutely. Um... Well, I'll tackle your first question first about the role of um, Asian Americans in politics. First of all, do not vote for somebody just because they're an Asian American, even if you're an Asian American. Okay? Just like I would tell a Black person, don't vote for a Black person just because they say they're Black. Latino person, don't vote for a Latino person just because they say they're Latino. I don't want that. I don't want that. However, I am concerned about the discourse, and I do want Asian Americans to get more involved in politics. And here's why. Um, because Asian Americans have arrived at a place in American history, not so, so much unlike Jewish Americans 
back in the 50s and 60s when they did not have much political power, but they had much intellectual capital and lots of brain power and everything like that. And um, at this, all the while, you know, colleges were discriminating against Jewish Americans. Now, colleges eventually, Harvard actually had a 15% quota on Jews. They eventually lifted that because of Jewish um, pressure. Um, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not certain that they're going to do the same thing for Asians. And here's why, because Harvard has gotten more progressive than ever. And they're so committed to racial equity and they need somebody to cut. They have to cut somebody for the sake of racial equity. Because if you look at the data, 55% of the top SAT scores in the nation are Asian, followed 40% whites, um, maybe 3% Hispanic, and unfortunately, 2% Black. Um, so if you look at the data, there is a racial disparity at the top end of academic achievement in our country. Um, and Harvard cannot admit equitably that is based on the representation of the population without cutting Asians. And they certainly don't want to cut the children of donors, the ones who are given $50 million gifts to Harvard. They certainly don't want to cut the legacies um, who provide the tradition and intellect, traditional backbone of, of, of the college. So they're going to cut Asian Americans because Asian Americans are what they think the least likely to speak out. And this is not just Harvard. This is um, many schools across the country, including Thomas Jefferson High School the top high school for science and mathematics that looked at a, a class that was 72% Asian and said, wow, there's so many Asians here, we have to cut them because we need to make room for all of the other races. That's what they think, that's, legitim that's legitimately what they think. They don't, they don't think about genuine merit anymore. They're not thinking about what's producing the most excellent class, what's going to produce the best scientists and engineers for our city and our country. They're thinking, how do we achieve the same racial balance that we want to achieve? That's what they're thinking. And so if Asian Americans don't speak up, if they don't talk about their stories, if they don't share you know, these, these, these unfair policies and how they're directly affecting them, then their voices will be lost in the discourse. So this is why I do encourage Asian Americans to stand up, not just for themselves, but for the principle of meritocracy. We don't care about your race. We just want a policy, we want societies that reward um, what people put in. Kenny, our TJ coalition uh, have moms, dads that belong to different races. I think bottom line is this is not about uh, a, only Asian Americans or Blacks or Hispanics. We have everyone. We have America uh, as part of that coalition. So uh, I think that's a good thing. And also, I think, Harvard, it's very important for people that are hearing to understand that this so-called World Center of Excellence, it is definitely a cadre of privileged progressive elites uh, stacking the de uh, deck against Asians. And you made a very good point where you feel like um, they can easily cut off Asians because they think that we don't speak. And also, we don't have the generational wealth. So it's not like my grandfather could have been a donor at Harvard, neither can I, do I have that generational wealth to be a donor? So it's like all the, I call them as woke whites, right? Largely white wealthy people um, uh, taking the seats away from Asian Americans or for that matter, any races at this point. So Kenny, I know you have very unique and unprecedented access to the major players fighting this deep racial ideologies propagated by academics today. So what do you hear from them? I know you speak a lot, you go out there, you're there. Will this, uh, you, do you think will this race, identity and culture war ever end in America as we are finally starting to speak up? Because you, you would have never heard about this even 10 years back for that matter. So do you think as the speaking up is going to put an end to this culture war or is it just getting worse in progressive world? What do you hear from the major players? I'm curious to know. Of those uh, those players' uh, thoughts. Yeah. First of all, the left outspends the right five to one um, wow. in this dialogue. People should know that. The, the and that's not just political action. That's 
nonprofits that sponsor left-leaning causes, everything like that, five to one. Um, so I'm, you know, me being a conservative per personally and politically um, makes me well aware of the disadvantaged, the underdog situation that we're in. So I, I'm here to tell you guys, don't lose hope. Don't lose hope. Um, you do have the power to move the ball forward. But you have to understand, they're not just going to, the, the instant you speak up, it's not like they're going to wipe their hands of it and say, okay, we're done. We're, we're leaving. And uh, congratulations to you. They're not going to do that. People dig in their heels. It's always darkest before the dawn. Um, we're winning. We're on the right side. Look at the Supreme Court. They took up the Harvard case. And this is not just about Harvard anymore. This is about what kind of culture do we want in our society now? You know, um, but, also, but also think about this. Think about the fact that America, one out of five new relationships and marriages are of people of a different race right now. Think about the fact that 96% of Americans are perfectly willing to live next to a neighbor of a different race. 91% are willing to marry their daughter into a person of a different race. We are becoming such a, we, we have become such a generous, loving, race-blind country. It's a beautiful country. We still live in a beautiful country. And you have these ideologues that want to take what is beautiful and stamp it into dust and turn it into dirt and cackle as they burn it down the cauldron because they feed off of despair. They make their careers off of despair. So I tell you, don't despair. Be happy warriors. Keep fighting. That is your, that is your goal. That is your responsibility. And you will. We are changing the tide right now, but we cannot stop. Thank you so much for inspiring us. I think Happy Warriors is a good one. I have one of our TJ mom who's very active mom as part of TJ Coalition, Ms. Datta. She was she commented saying that most parents, especially immigrant parents, have no clue of this indoctrination that's going on. They don't understand the curriculum. Uh, leftists are always there in the school board meetings talking about uh, their agenda. I think she's also wondering how can a campaign, what can we do as a campaign to make all parents be an aware and speak out? I think uh, that's what is our effort right now. I mean, there is a definitely much more organized leftist coalition energized to speak at school board meetings, supervisors meeting and so on and so forth. So I think that's why um, being in politics and policy world really helps. Kenny, um, I have a, another question. I've seen multiple, this happens in organizations, this happens in, uh, uh, I say, progressive young generation, right? Uh, why are these young um, Asians, even not only really young, even in organizations that are middle-aged, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, they sh um, why are these Asians shunning the model min minority narrative? That should be a compliment to them. I take that as a compliment, but there are some folks that completely shun that away from, uh, they, uh, they have no shame in saying, don't even utter that word. Why do you think uh, uh, people are so disgusted, especially some of these Asian Americans don't wanna use that? Okay, model minority is a hard topic to discuss. Um, I'm gonna open by saying, I, I mean, I, I don't think that we should stereotype people positively or negatively, right? I don't think that Asians should be stereotyped for being a, you know, too smart because actually that stereotype is now being used against them. Now. They're saying, well, you're too smart. You know, you can deal with not going to Harvard. You can go to, you know, another college instead and you'll do fine. And sure, a lot of Asians do do fine. There's, there's no doubt about that, but that doesn't change the fact that the policy is wrong <laughs> just because you, it, you, you get, just because people end up all right, doesn't mean the policy isn't wrong in the face if it discriminates against a group. Um, but I, I don't think that ultimately what, what I want is for people to be treated on the basis of what they have to offer. And that, that's America, that's the American idea. Meritocracy, the American dream. You know, it doesn't matter what background you come from, you come here, we're gonna give you a chance to succeed um, based on your hard work. Absolutely. Um, that's the kind of society that I want. 
Exactly. I think that's a beautiful society, a multicultural society. As you said, you gave some stats about how 90% of the people uh, in the due course of time are going to live in completely multicultural society. And that's a beautiful thing. So uh, I know you spoke a little bit about diversity and inclusion. I would love to hear your thoughts on diversity and exclusion <laughs> and not an inclusion of Amer Asian Americans, especially in the levers of big tech and finance. You know that's happening even in big tech and finance. What are your thoughts? Because at the end of the day, Asian Americans have great skills and competence when it comes to computers, ability, program ability. What happens if this diversity and exclusion of Asian Americans come into this levers of big tech and finance if it has not come in yet? Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, 70 to 90 percent of Google software engineers are Asian. Um, not even Asian American, just like Asian, like from India, from China, from Korea from Vietnam, um, they, you know, they are the levers of what makes Google work and everything like that. But you take a look at Google's diversity and inclusion report. They complain, they complain, blah, 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 blah. Like, um, over and over again, relentlessly about the underrepresentation of, uh, of other races, of other minority races, of Blacks and Hispanics, um, especially. And what they fail to understand underlying, or what, what, they, what they inherently understand, but they will not say in public, is that they, the, the, the powers that be at Google benefit from putting the focus away from Asians and putting it towards these groups that are very much underrepresented. Because these powers that be, they may feel challenged personally by the fact that there are the, the, the most talented engineers in the company are of a different race, they speak a different language, they're of a different culture. And they don't want to shine the light on these people because if they start celebrating these guys, if they start celebrating them too much, then maybe these guys will develop a backbone and self-confidence and, and say, well, well, heck, you know, I, I think that we should, um, you know, we, we are competent and we, we, we are competent and maybe we should go start our own firm, you know, or maybe we should go to business school or maybe we should figure it out. No. You know, that's, but that's not necessarily what they want, the, the management at the top of Google and Facebook. Now, that's, now the narrative that I just gave you is sort of conspiratorial. Uh, I, will, I will grant that. Um, it's, not, it's not a nice narrative. It doesn't make the Google's ma Google management look flattering by any means. Um, but you have to understand that DEI has never focused on Asian Americans. It has never, they never cared about Asians. They never wanted Asians. DEI was never intended for the inconvenient minority, Asian Americans. And when Asians come in and sort of disrupt the narrative a little bit, when Asians come in and without the help of DEI are still achieving and, and doing well and everything like that, well, that puts a direct target on these DEI officers back and they will do their best to try to ignore and suppress those voices. Yeah, I think uh, you, you really hit the nail on the head when you said they do not want uh, them to develop uh, a backbone uh, and decide that, hey, I can go and start my own firm. It's like my skills are uh, great. So uh, I think they just really want to crush that self-confidence in people. I know you said it's conspiratory, but uh, I think there is some truth to it. Um, Kenny, what are your thoughts about MIT and University of Chicago and multiple other universities that are bringing back SATs now? I know they kind of got rid of that for a couple of years, uh, but now they're trying to bring it back. W what do you tell them? Other than saying that I told you so. <laughs> <sighs> well, I told you so. And also, um, in my story, in my book, An Inconvenient Minority, I tell this story about a guy who was born to a family of orange farmers in Florida. And he was a really bad student. 
in his um, white guy, really bad student, um, constantly undisciplined, ran around, you know, basically got C's and D's at his school. They just passed him along. Nobody thought he had any potential. Then one day, just out of a stroke of luck, he decides he's going to take his PSAT. And he takes it. And the next day, the principal of the school walks into this poor public school in South Florida or in North Florida, where people die at the age of 40 because they've been farming oranges their whole life and they get scurvy and or sorry, not some some disease. And and the principal goes to this classroom and he says, who is Michael Munger? And this meek little ninth grader boy slowly raises his hand and the guy says, principal says, come with me. And he goes to the principal's office and he says, you should not be in this class. You are way too advanced. Wow. We're gonna put you in the calculus class. There's no way. And they discovered his potential because of the, S wow. of the PSAT, which is like a, 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 yeah. a, a first for version of the SAT. So it, it, it's also true that men tend to be, boys tend to be more disagreeable by nature. Um, and the grading system, focusing solely on grades actually tends to reward females over males. And so the SAT is a useful counterweight against that because sometimes you need disagreeable people in life. Of course you need agreeable people, nobody disputes that, but sometimes you need disagreeable people when something really needs to get done. And this Michael Munger guy, because of his score on the PSAT, was able to attend Duke University, sorry, was able to attend Davidson College, my alma mater, eventually become a professor of economics at Duke University. And he never, never in his life would have been able to do that without the standardized test. Yeah. I hope these elite universities listen to the story one person at a time, right? I mean, these are the stories that need to really come out. So Kenny, I, I know we spoke about TJ Coalition, but I do want you to know if you, if you are not aware, our Attorney General Jason Meares uh, uh, was joined by several other attorneys generals, including those from Georgia, South Carolina, Texas, and they filed an amicus brief against the Fairfax County School Board alleging its race admissions policy, I'm sure you know. So I, I think that's a very positive step um, on what's happening in NOVA. So Kenny, we are in the last few minutes. Uh, so I would love for you to take a few, uh, few minutes to kind of talk about anything that I missed. If you feel like I didn't address anything that's really going on out in the world, uh, any crucial uh, stuff, I want you to uh, talk about it right now. Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about education. Um, you know, people always ask this question, well, what are we going to do about the racial achievement gap in our country? Because right now you know, we have this racial achievement gap. Asians are the highest performers on various metrics, followed by whites, followed by Latinos, followed by black Americans. And that by the way, has not changed over the past 40 years. Also scores have not changed over the past 30 years, despite the fact that we've been spending three times as much money per student, that's adjusted for inflation. So we spend all this money, we're not getting results, what's happening, you know? And people need to understand that the money that we're spending is increasingly inefficient, is increasingly going into administrators um, whose jobs are to service various categories. Um, it's, in, it's actually, the, the spending that we're doing actually can sometimes cut into teaching time rather than increase teaching time because of all of the initiatives that we wanna do regarding social emotional learning, initiatives we wanna do regarding diversity and inclusion. Um, we bring nonprofits in um, to contract, we contract with people, we do all this tech support, we rely so much on laptops and get kids um, into computers really early, probably a little too early um, and it distracts them, it saps their attention. Um, we have this, we have this endless mill of standardized tests that we have to take. Look, I'm for, <laughs> I already told you, I'm for standardized tests in general. I just don't think we should be taking seven of them a year, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, 
And all of this is cutting into classroom instruction. All of this is cutting into children working with kids, especially low income kids. Um, we also have kids increasingly born into single parent families. That's another issue. Um, there's a lot that we need to do as a country to solve this. But one thing's for sure, we cannot solve this if we focus only on a single racial systemic racism perspective. Um, and we ignore things like culture, we ignore things like teaching, we ignore things like um, getting back to the fundamentals of learning. The more time you put in, the more things you get out. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to produce a better population, better educated population of all races. Absolutely. Kenny, this was very insightful. I felt like I learned quite a lot while you're speaking as well. I've gotten so much out of this session. I thank you for your time and thoughts tonight. I'm glad you took the two minutes to kind of emphasize much more on education. I think as Fairfax County GOP, that's kind of one of our thing that we are extremely focused on aligning with the uh, coalitions uh, um, that are very focused on education and excellence. And it's very important that you know that FCP has gotten a new superintendent. And I was actually watching the uh, proceedings as they were talking. And one of the school board member uh, talked about why they chose her and not a single word was talked about academic excellence and meritocracy or to build in more standards. It was more about empathy, which I think is all in important. She also spoke about her as being whipped more, but definitely not a focus on academics. So it just sort of terrifies me that this is uh, um, one of the biggest, uh, if not the largest, I think we are the lar largest uh, uh, county, school county board in the entire country. And we are bringing in a superintendent that's kind of focused on everything else, but not academic excellence. So we need more warriors like you. I We will continue to support you. I thank you for your courage to continue to blaze this trail and fight the impossible fight. Not only we, wa we want to root and support you, we are also joining your fight through TJ Coalition, through Open FCPS, several, several organizations and speaking up of what you believe. I thank you for joining us tonight. Any other parting words? <laughs> No, it's been it's been an amazing time. I'm really honored to come over. And um, if you want to follow me, follow me on Twitter at Kenny M. Shu. Definitely buy my book, An Inconvenient Minority, to get the full story and 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 about what we need to do to expose the falsity of this racism ideology and to fight back. Kenny, can, can you um, also tell where to listen to your podcast? Yeah, and definitely. Um, I do a lot of different podcasts. I just finished the first season um, of the, the Inconvenient Minority podcast. So just search Inconvenient Minority on all of your podcast platforms and uh, give it a listen. Thank you so much, Kenny. We appreciate your time. Viewers, as you know, we are living in confusing times. I say what we have believed strongly for thousands of years, such as work ethics, meritocracy, are being tossed and turned upside down in the name of social justice. We need more citizens like Kenizu, more parents and students to understand who we are, what we stand for, and what we are willing to fight for. Just as, th uh, just as uh, Thomas Sowell, an economic, uh, American economist, and social theorists said, if you have always believed that everyone should play by the same rules and be judged by the same standards, that would have been lab you being labeled as radical 60 years ago, a liberal 30 years ago, now a racist. So for that standard, I think anybody that believes in meritocracy is a, is a racist, which is a very sad story in America. And uh, we, I think Kenny uh, summarized it well, we need to be happy warriors. We have to be positive, we want to get out, we want to collaborate with each of us, we need to educate our parents, educate our students, educate our community, and just be happy warriors and go out and let's fight it out. I hope you feel that this, um, this session by Kenny Sue was informative, inspired and invigorating. I have no doubt, I have such positive comments on Facebook Live. So that being said, we will see you tomorrow at the same time with the 11th Congressional District candidate, Manga Anantatmula. Thank you. You have a wonderful rest of the evening, Kenny. God bless you. You are a warrior. Keep up the good work. Your parents should be very proud of who they raised. They raised a great young man who is going to make better things in the world. And God bless you all viewers. Have a wonderful weekend.